This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 60, Munchausen Syndrome by Proxy, Part 3. Over the last two episodes, I told you the story of five-year-old Garnet Spears, whose mother was convicted of his 2014 murder by sodium poisoning. Garnet's entire life was filled with medical procedures, treatments, medications, even surgeries he didn't need, all thanks to his mother's pathological need for attention. In this episode, the third in my series about Munchausen syndrome by proxy, I'll tell you the stories of other children affected by medical child abuse, and other caregivers, mostly mothers, whose bizarre behavior, lies, and willingness to abuse and even kill the children in their care is the reason for their inclusion on this list. This is part three in my series about the inexplicable phenomenon of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. My sources for this week were an article by Mallory Ungvarsky titled Mother Knows Best, Court Documents, a Forensic Files episode called Broken Bond, The Lone Star Love Triangle, True Crime by Greg Olson, Cruel Deception, also by Greg Olson, Ancient Faces, Murderpedia, Wikipedia, a 1989 book by Joyce Eggington titled From Cradle to Grave, an article by Delaney R. Bartlett titled Mary Beth Tinning, I Am Not a Good Mother, Listverse, Healthline, Tucson.com, ABC News, KOLD News 13, the Arizona Department of Corrections website, Oregon Live, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, ABC 30, WFAA, the Cincinnati Inquirer, and the Denver Channel. Before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to my newest patron, Wendy from Hubbards, Nova Scotia. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you to all of my patrons. Your monthly pledges bring me that much closer to my goal, and I can't thank you enough. To help support the show, you can visit www.suffertheLittleChildrenPod.com and click Become a Patron in the upper right corner. Thank you all. One more thing before I jump into the stories. I'm all about learning and growing, and when I receive constructive criticism, I try very hard to see where the person is coming from so I can better understand what I need to do to improve myself and the podcast. Over the last couple of episodes, and in many episodes before those, I've addressed the subjects of mental health, mental illnesses, and personality disorders, and I want to touch briefly on that. Again, I'm not a doctor or an expert in the field of psychology by any means. I only talk about these things with any authority at all because I have many years of both first-hand and up-close and personal experience with both mental illnesses and personality disorders. My family, including myself, my children, my ex, his family, and extended family members, deal with a variety of these issues. I've seen the effects a parent's personality disorder can have on a child and how those traits can be passed down to the child, and I know all too well how much work it can be, and sometimes how futile, to intervene with various methods in an attempt to avoid the traits taking hold in a full-blown personality disorder. Complicating all of this is the fact that many mental illnesses are comorbid with personality disorders, and many of these conditions share traits, so properly diagnosing and treating a patient can take years if it's accomplished at all. When I say that mental illnesses and personality disorders are different, I definitely don't intend to marginalize or invalidate anyone. The main difference between the two categories in the opinions of some experts is that mental illnesses tend to be more biologically based and often respond well to medication, whereas personality disorders are often seen as more psychologically based and are better treated with behavioral therapy. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule, but that's the general idea I'm trying to convey. I certainly don't believe that one is better than the other or more valid. It all comes down to the ability and willingness of the patient to receive and maintain a treatment regimen that works for them. Many people with personality disorders are highly resistant to treatment, and their behavior impacts not only their lives, but the lives of those around them as well, because their behavior is more intentional than that of someone with a mental illness. That doesn't mean the behavior is always controlled by conscious thought. 
It just means that it's not caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, but instead by a lifelong pattern of behavior that's almost never engaged in intentionally. Just to make it clear, I don't believe that everyone with a personality disorder is a bad person by any stretch of the imagination. These disorders don't come from a void. Defined, a personality disorder is, according to the American Psychiatric Association, a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that deviates from the expectations of the culture, causes distress or problems functioning, and lasts over time. Such a disorder is often created or exacerbated by childhood trauma, and the behavior and decisions of the person suffering from the disorder are often so deeply ingrained that the person doesn't seem to know any other way of behaving. That's why behavioral therapy is the only effective way to treat these disorders. The person needs to learn how to break the cycle of their disordered thinking and negative behaviors to avoid causing emotional or even physical harm to themselves or those close to them. A personality disorder can be very difficult to treat or overcome, but it's entirely possible when the patient accepts both diagnosis and treatment. I want to apologize if any of my remarks come off as insensitive or ignorant, because that's the exact opposite of what I'm intending. Like I said, I'm always looking for ways to improve, and I welcome constructive criticism. I appreciate all of you and your feedback. Tanya Thaxton was born in Moore, Texas in 1957 to parents John Allen Thaxton and Wanda Ruth Roden. When Tanya was young, her mother had various health problems. As a preschooler, during one of Wanda's hospitalizations, Tanya's aunt took her to the hospital to have a small cyst removed from under her arm, and although Tanya later said the ether mask was scary, she left the experience with happy memories. They put me in mother's room, and mother picked me up and moved me in bed with her. She held me next to her for hours and hours. Health-related issues seemed to pop up frequently for Tanya herself while she was growing up. Once, she stubbed her toe and it became severely infected. Another time, while playing hide-and-seek with one of her three sisters, Tanya managed to put her left arm through a plate glass window, severing an artery. Tanya, whose family called her Tonto because they considered her the black sheep of the family, often cared for wounded birds and other small animals. One of her sisters said Tanya always wanted the miracle of saving a life. When Tanya was 20, she married the boy next door, 26-year-old Raymond L. Reed Jr. Things were fine between Tanya and Ray at the beginning. Their first child, a healthy daughter named Carolyn, came along in 1981. Tanya became a licensed vocational nurse, and Ray had a good job with frequent promotions that often led to their relocation, so they bounced back and forth from Texas to Illinois to Iowa. All of the moves eventually took a toll on the marriage. By early 1983, the little family was living in Illinois, Tanya was pregnant with their second child, and the strain of their life was beginning to show. Tanya felt as if she wasn't getting enough attention from her constantly working husband. On May 17, 1983, the couple's second child, Morgan Renee Reed, was born. She was a perfectly beautiful baby girl with very little blonde hair and a charming, toothless smile. Where two-year-old Carolyn appeared perfectly healthy, little Morgan was plagued with health issues. Tanya freaked out at the slightest sign of illness, but she frequently reported that Morgan suffered from seizures and would stop breathing. Tanya always administered life-saving measures before EMS arrived, but even so, Morgan was constantly being rushed to the emergency room, so often that neighbors said if they heard sirens, they knew an ambulance was on its way to the Reed's house. Tanya thrived on attention and sympathy. When she talked with other neighborhood moms, their regular kids' stories paled in comparison to the tales of excitement and horror Tanya had to tell about her kids' medical adventures. The Reeds were soon transferred yet again, this time to Hereford, Texas. By this time, Morgan had been rushed to the hospital approximately 20 times during her short life. The final trip took place on the afternoon of Tuesday, February 7, 1984, when Deaf Smith County EMS were summoned to the Reeds' three-bedroom ranch home at 140 Pecan Street where baby Morgan, eight and a half months old, had once again been reported as not breathing. This time, however, Tanya was unable to resuscitate her infant daughter, and Morgan was rushed to the hospital before being transferred to Northwest Texas Hospital in Amarillo. All efforts to revive Morgan were unsuccessful, and the baby never regained consciousness. That evening, she was declared brain dead, and life support was withdrawn. About 14 hours later, at 11.22 a.m. on February 8th, Morgan Renee Reed died in her mother's arms. An autopsy was conducted, finding Morgan's manner of death to be undetermined and the cause listed as brain death secondary to cardiorespiratory arrest of unknown origin. Another significant issue discovered during the autopsy that was not related to Morgan's cause of death was Fragile X syndrome, 
a genetic anomaly that causes mild to moderate intellectual disabilities, although it does not pose a significant risk of death in infants or children. If anything, it may shorten the person's life by an average of about 12 years. The medical examiner also found Morgan suffered from moderate hydrocephalus, which can either be present at birth or acquired afterward. The finding of hydrocephalus is particularly interesting because, as I mentioned, it was noted not to have contributed to Morgan's cause of death. Hydrocephalus is the buildup of fluid in the ventricles inside the brain. It was not noted if Morgan was born with the condition, but it's important to point out that it can be caused by head injury or bleeding on the brain. Speaking of which, a number of final diagnoses were listed in the autopsy report, the most alarming of which were retinal hemorrhages and acute subdural hematoma, or a collection of blood between the membranes that protect the brain, which is almost always caused by a traumatic head injury. The medical examiner did not find any external signs of a head injury, so he assumed the bleeding on Morgan's brain had occurred on its own. In the report, he wrote, The acute subdural hematoma consisted of recent clotted blood. There was no external evidence of cranial trauma. There was no evidence of child abuse. It would later be discovered that the medical examiner had never heard of shaken baby syndrome, of which two of the telltale signs are retinal hemorrhaging and bleeding on the brain. Hydrocephalus can also be a complication of shaken baby syndrome. In the early 80s, doctors and pathologists didn't have the detailed understanding they do now about child abuse, shaken baby syndrome, and even Munchausen syndrome by proxy, let alone how often they actually cause children's deaths. Because of this lack of knowledge, it was widely assumed that Morgan most likely died of sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS. Morgan was buried in the North Lawn Memorial Garden Cemetery in Dumas, Texas, wearing a yellow pinafore dress and white tights, with a little white bonnet on her head to cover the incisions made during the autopsy. A few months after Morgan died, the Reed family was transferred to Chicago, where, before long, Tanya became pregnant with the couple's third child. During her pregnancy, Tanya suddenly began having fainting spells, in which she would dramatically collapse to the floor and conveniently regain consciousness when paramedics showed up. Tanya and Ray welcomed their son, Robert Matthew Reed, on May 2, 1985. The little boy, who they called Matthew, weighed 10 pounds at birth and appeared to be perfectly healthy. Even so, Tanya underwent a tubal ligation procedure the following day to prevent any future pregnancies. She told friends she did this because it was too risky to continue having children when they knew there was something wrong with their genes. For the first few weeks, Tanya told everyone Matthew was a happy, happy baby who slept through the night, never bothering us a bit. Then, 26 days after he was born, Matthew began experiencing episodes of apnea just like his older sister Morgan had. Tanya reported that her son had seizures in which he became practically catatonic and stopped breathing. These episodes continued throughout Matthew's first two years. In July of 1987, the family once again picked up and moved, this time to an apartment at 7411 Canterbury Road in Urbandale, Iowa. Despite Matthew's apnea episodes, the family seemed happy enough. Carolyn was six and Matthew was two. Tanya later told an interviewer that she and Ray experienced some stress in their marriage after Morgan died, like any couple would, but they toughed it out. Matthew's medical emergencies continued in Iowa. In fact, they took place so often that paramedics quickly began doubting Tanya's stories and contacted Urbandale police to inform the authorities about their suspicions. Matthew, they told police, had repeatedly been reported to have seizures and stop breathing, but by the time EMS arrived, his mother, a nurse, had heroically resuscitated the toddler. There was a pattern to these calls, they noted. They tended to come in around the same time of day and almost always on Tuesdays and Fridays when Ray was at work. Doctors were stumped as to the cause of Matthew's seizures and breathing issues. One doctor suggested the little boy might be holding his breath. By this time, Tanya was a familiar, if not entirely welcome, face at the local hospitals, where staff noticed that when it came time to admit Matthew once again, Tanya seemed excited rather than nervous or upset. She would stand around and chit-chat, smiling and greeting the doctors and nurses she had become familiar with, acting like a carefree woman at a cocktail party rather than the concerned mother of an inexplicably sick toddler. Matthew's medical records indicate some of the nurses had taken note of a strange dynamic between Tanya and her two-year-old son. One nurse wrote in the chart, Mom and child interaction somewhat inappropriate, i.e. seem antagonistic toward each other. Matthew seemed disturbed when Tanya returned to his room from the cafeteria. Once, from his crib, the barely vocal baby actually yelled, Mom, go, over and over again. On February 7, 1988, 
coincidentally or not, the fourth anniversary of Morgan's death, Ray Reed was relaxing, taking in a peaceful, work-free Sunday afternoon. He could hear Tanya and their son upstairs laughing. Then the sound stopped. Seconds later, Tanya began screaming that Matthew had had another spell, and she called for an ambulance. While they waited for EMS to arrive, Tanya gave Matthew mouth-to-mouth, once again reviving him before the medics showed up and loaded him into the ambulance. By the time EMS wheeled little Matthew into the emergency room of Blank Children's Hospital, he was downright furious, screaming and kicking his little pajama-clad legs, his blonde hair plastered to his head with sweat. He wasn't crying, but actually screaming, almost hysterical. Meanwhile, Tanya stood nearby, looking well-groomed with her dark hair neatly done, calmly describing to the doctors what had taken place this time. Nurse Callie Sandquist noticed that Tanya gave incredible detail and knew all the appropriate medical terms that most parents wouldn't remember. She completely ignored her son's screeching and didn't even bother to walk over to the baby and soothe him in any way. Not long afterward, one of the doctors stormed out of the trauma room, furious, and shocked her colleagues by slamming Matthew's chart down on the counter with a bang. Her words were even more shocking. She's smothering that kid. Medical staff contacted the Iowa Department of Human Services and requested a child abuse investigator, alleging Matthew was being abused by his mother, who they suspected had Munchausen syndrome by proxy and was causing him to stop breathing to get attention for herself as the hero who repeatedly resuscitated him. No one but Tanya, they realized, had ever witnessed the onset of one of Matthew's spells, which usually took place while his father was at work. When asked about this during an interview years later, Tanya said, I was the one that was always there. In circumstances, yeah, but I think any woman whose husband works and she is a home, stays home and takes care of the kids, it's going to happen that way. Prior to the investigator's arrival, Nurse Sandquist noticed four small parallel scratch marks on Matthew's cheek that looked to have been made by a child's fingernails, as if he had scratched himself trying to remove someone's hands from his throat or face. Moments later, Tanya Reed approached the nurse, displaying a scratch on her right index finger and asking for a bandage. Child abuse investigator Mark Gillespie responded to the hospital, where he interviewed medical staff prior to meeting with the Reeds. The identity of the suspect was clear, and Tanya was aghast at the idea that anyone would suspect her of abusing her own children. In a later interview, when asked how she felt at that moment, Tanya said, Angry and hurt that it would even be surprised, shock. You know, what every term probably went through, every form of emotion there is. Tanya was irate that she was being accused of harming Michael all because the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. She took a lie detector test and passed. When investigators found out that Matthew had a sister who died four years prior from the same inexplicable breathing problems he suffered, they were very interested, and they reached out to the Northwest Texas Hospital in Amarillo for a copy of Morgan's autopsy report. In the meantime, Matthew was discharged from the hospital after four days and returned home with his parents. Investigators and medical staff alike all felt a sense of urgency, especially now that Morgan's death had come to light. They knew if something wasn't done soon, Matthew may be the next Reed child to end up in a cemetery. On March 1, 1988, Matthew was once again rushed to the hospital, this time Mercy Hospital in Urbandale, once again after being revived by his mother's mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Time was running out for little Matthew, who was sent home the same evening. A few days later, investigators received Morgan's autopsy report and immediately contacted Iowa State Medical Examiner Dr. Tom Bennett, asking him to look it over. Within hours, Dr. Bennett determined that the lack of external injuries on Morgan's head indicated shaken baby syndrome. Investigators and medical staff together determined that Matthew was in grave danger and should be removed from the Reed home as quickly as possible. Carolyn, they determined, was old enough to speak up if she was abused, so the focus had to be on Matthew's safety. Within days, a Des Moines court issued a removal order, and Matthew was removed from his daycare center and placed into foster care under the supervision of Iowa DHS. Once he was out of the family home, Matthew never again experienced a single seizure or interruption in his breathing. Tanya Thaxton Reed ticked all the boxes on the Munchausen by proxy profile. She was a woman. She worked in the medical field. She had an emotionally distant relationship with her spouse. Her child's medical emergencies never occurred in the care of a babysitter or at daycare. She consistently demanded more tests and second opinions and there was a family history of similar health issues and even the unexplained death of Matthew's sister. 
investigators rapidly pulled together a case, and on August 10, 1988, Tanya was arrested and charged with the felony child endangerment of her son in Iowa. February of 1989 saw the beginning of Tanya's trial, during which prosecutor Melody Haynes presented a clear pattern of child abuse that began with baby Morgan and continued with Matthew. She told the jury of 18 separate occasions when Tanya deliberately suffocated Matthew, only to revive him and accompany him to the hospital. Multiple witnesses testified to the various elements of the case, but none was more compelling than the defendant herself, Tanya Reed, who took the stand on March 2, 1989. During direct examination by her attorney, Tanya vehemently denied harming either of her children. Did you kill her? No, sir, I definitely did not. Did you shake her to death? No, sir. Did you bring about these seizures? No, I did not. On cross-examination, Prosecutor Haynes dropped a bomb, asking Tanya if she had ever before cared for a child who experienced a similar breathing issue as her two children did. Tanya testified that she didn't recall any such situation, but agreed with the prosecutor that if it had, it would be a huge coincidence. Of that moment, Melody Haynes later said, When she said no, uh, I could have kissed her because, I mean, it, it was such a lie. It was such an egregious lie. It turned out that in 1974, when Tanya was 15, she was babysitting for an infant who stopped breathing. She immediately called the operator to summon paramedics and was credited with saving the baby's life. Tanya became a local hero, even winning the Good Neighbor Award for her quick reaction to the emergency. What a huge coincidence. Prosecutor Haynes later said, Mark Pennington is an outstanding trial attorney, but I have never seen a defense lawyer turn whiter than a sheet like he did at that very moment. And I was never really sure if he actually did know about that. On April 28, 1989, Tanya was found guilty of felony child endangerment and sentenced to 10 years in prison. She and Ray subsequently divorced, and Carolyn and Matthew grew up in the home of Ray and his new wife. Meanwhile, not long after Tanya's conviction in Iowa, she was indicted in Death Smith County, Texas, for the murder of her daughter, Morgan Renee Reed. This would be a landmark trial, as no one had ever officially been tried for child abuse or murder due to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. The theory investigators had developed was that the last time Tanya had smothered Morgan, she had been unable to resuscitate her, so in desperation, she picked up the baby and violently shook her in a bid to start her breathing again. The aggressive shaking caused Morgan's brain to bleed and the blood vessels in her retinas to hemorrhage. The jury evidently agreed because on December 13, 1993, they found Tanya Thaxton Reed guilty of her daughter's murder. She was sentenced to 62 years in prison. Two years later, Tanya's conviction was overturned. She was retried in 1998, then aged 38, and sentenced to 40 years in prison in Gatesville, Texas. That verdict was upheld on appeal. Tanya has always insisted she did not hurt her children, which is not unusual for perpetrators of MSP. When asked if she maintained her innocence, Tanya said, Yes, always will. I'll maintain it forever. I am having to do my time, and I accept that. I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it which I have. Ultimately, Tanya Thaxton Reed was paroled in 2008. She had hoped to move to California and start a new life, but as of 2014, she had moved back home to Dumas, Texas, where she worked at McDonald's. It's unknown what she's doing these days. The most recent information I was able to find is that as of a few years ago, Matthew was the only family member who no longer had contact with her. Both Ray and Carolyn had stood by her. Matthew suffered permanent hearing loss that he believed was caused by his mother's abuse. As for the little boy whose life Tanya supposedly saved in 1974, Scotty Simmons was a perfectly healthy four-month-old boy when Tanya babysat for him while his parents went to a church meeting. After his ordeal, due to lack of oxygen to his brain, Scotty was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and brain damage, but he still graduated from high school with honors. Scotty's parents told him what happened to him, although they didn't suspect anything was off with Tanya until 1989, when the DA from Des Moines, Iowa, reached out to Scotty's parents and wanted to talk to them about Tanya, who was then on trial for abusing her own son. Scotty is still not angry with Tanya, saying, If I had any bitterness towards Tanya, it would only hurt me. There is no point. There is nothing I can do about it. I can only look ahead and make the best out of what I can do now. Just as I said in the last episode about Lacey Spears, Greg Olson, who literally wrote the book about Tanya, doesn't believe she intended to kill Morgan, and even visited her in jail to tell her so after her murder conviction. He said, 
I felt such sorrow for her. I wanted to reach under the pass-through screen and pat her hand and tell her how sorry I was. So sorry for her family and children, especially her children. Was this the role others had assumed? Is this what she wanted? I'll never know. While Tanya has served her sentence and moved on with her life, while Ray, Carolyn, and Matthew have also moved on with their lives as best they can, sweet little Morgan Renee Reed never had that opportunity. She died at only eight and a half months old. Not much has been said about her as a person because she had no opportunity to develop a personality and see where life took her. All we really know about Morgan herself was that she was described as an angelic, smiley baby girl, and she was adored by everyone who met her. We can never let Morgan be forgotten. Rest in peace, little one. I've been in a love-hate relationship with my hair for the past year. I have really long, really thick hair, but I haven't had a trim since before quarantine started, so it was starting to feel like I had straw growing out of my head. I tried a couple of the more expensive drugstore shampoos and conditioners, but they didn't help much. Then I found out about Gemist, and I swear it's changed my life, or at least my hair, for the better. Gemist is a company that makes salon-quality hair care products backed by science. I took the two-minute quiz on their website, and they matched me with the perfect shampoo and conditioner for my hair type and texture based on the answers I gave them. I'm not kidding, the difference in my hair is for real. It's seriously so soft and touchable, and I can even run my fingers through it, even right after I get out of the shower, which I've never been able to do before. This stuff is magic. Did I mention that Gemist smells amazing? There are hints of mixed berries, pink pepper, lily of the valley, rose, crushed tonka bean, amber, and even a splash of orange. My son keeps burying his face in my hair because it smells so good. Also, and this is really cool, Gemist products use quality ingredients and are sulfate-free, paraben-free, dye-free, manufactured in the U.S., and never tested on animals. You can even try Gemist risk-free with free and easy returns within 30 days. If you're ready to have the best hair of your life, you have to try Gemist. Right now, my listeners can give Gemist a try and get 20% off their shampoo and conditioner smart subscription. Smart subscribers already save 20% on each order, so this is an amazing deal. And with free two-day shipping, you could have it by this weekend. Just visit Gemist.com to get your personalized recommendation and enter the code CHILDREN at checkout for 20% and free two-day shipping. That's Gemist.com, G-E-M-M-I-S-T.com, and enter my code CHILDREN at checkout to get the best hair of your life. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Using my coupon code CHILDREN means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money, so check out smilebrilliant.com today. Barbara Ann, Joseph Jr., Jennifer, Timothy, Nathan, Mary Frances, Jonathan, Tammy Lynn. These are the names of the eight children born to Joseph and Mary Beth Tinning between 1967 and 1985. All eight of those children, as well as an adopted brother, Michael, died before they reached the age of five. Mary Beth is one of the most infamous female serial killers in American history. She has been the subject of countless true crime documentaries, TV shows, podcasts, books, and articles, so I won't go into a super deep dive on her case, just a relatively quick overview. Mary Beth Rowe, a former nursing student, married Joseph Tinning in the spring of 1965, and the couple settled into a home near Schenectady, New York. 
Their first child, Barbara Ann, was born on May 31, 1967, and on January 10, 1970, Joseph Jr. was born. The third child, Jennifer, entered the world on December 26, 1971, but Jennifer was not long for this earth. She was born with a lethal combination of hemorrhagic meningitis and multiple brain abscesses, and after only eight days, Jennifer died. Mary Beth reportedly told nurses she had attempted to induce labor so Jennifer would be born on Christmas Day, so it's entirely possible she may have caused her daughter's fatal infections, although it's impossible to say. Jennifer's death evidently set something off in the mind of 29-year-old Mary Beth, possibly combined with the recent death of her father, Elton Rowe, in October of 1971, not to mention her self-reported childhood history of maltreatment, neglect, derision, and even confinement to her bedroom for up to a day at a time. As a child, Mary Beth was reported to have few friends, and she was known to lie and embellish to draw attention to herself. Regardless of the cause, after Jennifer's death, none of Mary Beth's children were safe. A little more than two weeks later, on January 20, 1972, little Joey, who had just turned two that month, was rushed to the hospital, where he died of what doctors determined to be cardiopulmonary arrest. Barely a month later, on March 1, 1972, Mary Beth showed up at the hospital with another dying child. This time, she claimed four-year-old Barbara had gone into convulsions. Barbara remained in the comatose state for several hours before finally succumbing on March 2nd, the victim of what was purported to be Rye syndrome, which is a rare condition that causes brain swelling and liver damage. Barbara was buried with her brother Joey in the Most Holy Redeemer Cemetery in Schenectady County, where their sister, Jennifer, was also laid to rest. What a tragedy, friends and neighbors thought, for the Tinning family to lose all three of their children in as many months. It was no wonder then that Mary Beth reached out to the Schenectady Department of Social Services later that year, wanting to become a foster parent. Maybe she'd have better luck with a child who was not blood-related. That actually did prove to be the case, at least for a while. For several months in the fall of 1972, Mary Beth and Joseph were foster parents to a little boy named Robert, who left their home in January of 1973. They then took in a second foster child, Linda, who returned to the custody of social services after Mary Beth found out she was pregnant again. The Tinning's fourth biological child, Timothy, was born on Thanksgiving Day, November 21, 1973. Nineteen days later, Mary Beth showed up in the emergency room once again with the limp body of one of her children in her arms. Little Timothy was already dead by the time they arrived, and with no other obvious cause, his death was attributed to SIDS. He was buried in the same cemetery as his three older siblings. By early 1974, the Tinnings' marriage was on the rocks, and they had multiple arguments, mostly about money, during this time. Mary Beth's behavior became extremely erratic. She attempted to poison Joseph with grape juice laced with barbiturates. Incredibly, even though she later admitted to the attempted murder, Joseph inexplicably forgave her. In May of 1974, Mary Beth reported a home burglary which police came to believe she herself had staged, possibly for attention. On March 30, 1975, Mary Beth gave birth to the couple's fifth child, Nathan, who was sent home with an apnea monitor and made it to a whole five months old before Mary Beth brought his dead body into the hospital, saying she was driving her car with Nathan in the front seat when she noticed he had stopped breathing. Nathan's cause of death was determined to be SIDS. The Tinnings miraculously lived for almost three years without children before, on August 3, 1978, they adopted newborn Michael. Incredibly, caseworkers felt so sorry for the Tinnings after hearing about all of their dead children that the adoption was a breeze. Not quite three months later, Mary Beth gave birth to another child, Mary Frances, who was two months old when Mary Beth burst into the emergency room with her on January 20, 1979. Mary Frances was able to be revived, and the medical staff labeled the near-miss as aborted SIDS. Exactly one month later, on February 20th, Mary Beth and Mary Frances returned to the hospital. The baby was revived again, but this time she had suffered irreversible brain damage, and two days later, 36-year-old Mary Beth made the decision to take her daughter off life support. Mary Frances was pronounced dead on February 22nd, 1979, and she was buried near her older brothers and sisters. Mary Beth must have sprinted home after her daughter's funeral and immediately gotten pregnant again, because almost exactly nine months later, on November 19, 1979, the Tinnings' eighth child, Jonathan, was born. About three months after that, Mary Beth brought him into the hospital, not breathing, where he was revived. Due to the family's history, Jonathan was sent to Boston Hospital for an in-depth examination, where doctors could find no reason whatsoever that Jonathan stopped breathing, and he was sent home. 
Just days later, Mary Beth brought Jonathan back to the hospital, where he was determined to be brain dead. Jonathan was pronounced dead on March 24, 1980, and no definitive cause of death was ever found, so it was assumed he died of breathing difficulties. Jonathan was the seventh and last tinning sibling to be buried in the Most Holy Redeemer Cemetery. Meanwhile, little Michael, the tinning's adopted son, had fared quite well all this time. That was until about a year after Jonathan's death on March 2, 1981, when Mary Beth carried the unconscious two-and-a-half-year-old into her pediatrician's office, wrapped in a blanket. She told the doctor that Michael had been sleeping and she couldn't awaken him, but it was immediately apparent that Michael was already dead. All Mary Beth could offer was that Michael had fallen down the stairs a week before and hit his head, but he had been fine afterward. Michael was buried with his adoptive grandparents in Schenectady Memorial Park. Up till then, suspicions had grown up around Mary Beth like weeds, but for the most part, doctors believed the string of deaths in the Tinning family was caused by an undiagnosed genetic disorder. After Michael's death, though, any possibility that the children's deaths had a genetic cause went straight out the window, and all eyes were on Mary Beth, who apparently decided to fly under the radar for a while and took a a four-and-a-half-year hiatus from popping out babies. She didn't, however, stop seeking attention. In 1982, Mary Beth and Joe bought a trailer in nearby Duanesburg, but their happy little home was about as short-lived as their children, catching on fire and burning to the ground shortly afterward. It was never proven, but it is strongly suspected that Mary Beth caused the fire. The following year, the couple moved back to Schenectady, where Mary Beth began working as a bus driver to fill her time. On August 22, 1985, the ninth tinning baby, Tammy Lynn, was born and Mary Beth somehow managed to keep her alive almost four months before making a frantic telephone call to her neighbor on December 19th, saying the baby was unresponsive. Tammy was rushed to the hospital, but she was pronounced dead on December 20th, 1985. Her death was determined to have been caused by asphyxia by suffocation, and spots of blood were later found on the pillow in Tammy's crib. Tammy was buried at Schenectady Memorial Park in the same plot with her grandparents and older brother, Michael. An investigation was launched by the Schenectady County Department of Social Services and the Schenectady Police Department, who brought in the New York State Bureau of Criminal Investigation. The police chief reached out to renowned forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden, asking his opinion on the possibility of nine children from the same family dying of SIDS. He asked me if it were possible for nine babies in one family to die of natural causes. I told him, no, it didn't seem possible to me. And I asked him to send me the case records in all nine children. When I looked at the medical records, I found that the doctors were attributing all of these deaths to a genetic problem in the family. When children with genetic disease die, they die slowly. They get symptoms, they get sick. They die more like a fan that gradually comes to a stop. Natural death is a process. It isn't unexpected and sudden, usually. In addition, there was an adopted baby, Michael. Nothing genetically the same as the parents. And suddenly, that baby died under similar circumstances as as the other children. The concept that the cause of death was inherited was clearly wrong. The other thing I noted was that the only person with the babies when they died was the mother. One baby, Nathan, died in the car on the way to the hospital. Many of the babies were blue when they were seen at the hospital. Sid's babies look perfectly healthy. When a baby that's been previously healthy turns blue and then dies, it means there's some kind of obstruction to their ability to breathe, some kind of suffocation. I told the police that the tinning children had died of homicidal asphyxia. Mary Beth and Joe were questioned separately on February 4, 1986, at which time Mary Beth confessed to smothering Tammy Lynn, Nathan, and Timothy to death, although she denied harming her other six children, and she later retracted her confession to Timothy's and Nathan's murders and claimed not to remember smothering Tammy. Why did she smother her children to death, police wondered? Mary Beth told them, I am not a good mother. Dr. Bodden believes Mary Beth Tinning embodied Munchausen syndrome by proxy, describing her as a sympathy junkie. It certainly couldn't have hurt either that Mary Beth was given a baby shower for each child, was the center of attention at each of their funerals, and received an insurance check after each death, enabling her to go on shopping sprees to reward herself. Mary Beth later suggested the reason she murdered her children, at least the one she still claimed responsibility for, 
was because she was a very damaged and just a messed up person who had been scarred by the earlier deaths of her other children. After being allowed to confess to her husband that she had killed their youngest daughter, Mary Beth dictated a 36-page confession, admitting to the murders of three of her children. Mary Beth was charged only with Tammy Lynn's murder, and after a trial that lasted six weeks, on July 17, 1987, 44-year-old Mary Beth Tinning was found guilty of second-degree murder. Later that year, she received a sentence of 20 years to life in state prison. Although she tried to recant her confession to Timothy and Nathan's deaths, Mary Beth was indicted in 1989 for her two sons' murders, but those charges were ultimately dropped due to lack of evidence. I mentioned in the last episode that another MSP perpetrator I planned to discuss had served her sentence in the same prison Lacey Spears currently occupies, and that was good old Mary Beth here, who served 31 years of her sentence at the Bedford Hills Prison for Women. She made multiple attempts for parole over the years, and after her seventh appearance before the parole board, Mary Beth was released on parole on August 21, 2018. Her husband, Joe, supported her throughout her time in prison and was present when she was released. The two are thought to be living together in the same home in Schenectady where they lived before Mary Beth's incarceration. According to a New York Department of Corrections spokesperson, Mary Beth has a curfew, must attend domestic violence counseling, and will remain on supervised parole for the rest of her life. She is currently 78 years old and reported to be laying low these days. I'm just thankful she's too old to have any more children. Because of the time period, it's very difficult to find many photos of the Tinning kids, and in fact, there don't seem to be any photos of Jennifer or Timothy to be found. I'll include the photos I did manage to find in the Facebook album for this episode. It's overwhelming that nine children from the same family didn't even have a chance at life, once again thanks to their mother's selfish need for attention. Like I do for every child I feature on the podcast and the blog, I'll be sure to mark each one of the Tinning children's birthdays and the anniversaries of their deaths on my social media pages. Every last one of them deserves to be remembered. On February 23, 2011, 21-year-old Blanca Renius Montano entered the University of Arizona Medical Center with her young son and her six-month-old daughter, saying both children were exhibiting flu-like symptoms. Tests, however, showed the children tested positive for E. coli, a bacteria that normally lives in the intestines of humans and some animals. Most E. coli strains are harmless, but some, when introduced into an otherwise healthy person's body, can cause severe infections, the symptoms of which can include diarrhea, abdominal pain, and fever. Severe cases can cause bloody diarrhea, dehydration, kidney failure, and even death. Most people can avoid being infected with E. coli by washing their hands and preparing their food safely, because contaminated food or water is the most common cause of E. coli infection. It's pretty hard to avoid, though, if your own mother is injecting fecal matter directly into your IV lines, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Upon admittance to the hospital, Blanca's children began receiving treatment immediately. Her son made a full recovery and was released from the hospital in short order. Her daughter, who I'll call Daria, was not so lucky, and her health continued to decline. Two days after her admission, she was moved to the pediatric intensive care unit to receive treatment for multiple blood infections, which had put the baby into septic shock. Daria spent two months in the pediatric ICU, where she developed between six and nine subsequent life-threatening bacterial infections, recovering from one infection only to develop another one in its wake. She was placed on countless courses of antibiotics to battle the infections. Doctors and specialists swarmed over the baby, performing a multitude of tests, including MRIs, CAT scans, an echocardiogram, immune deficiency tests, and even some tests as invasive and painful as a bone marrow biopsy and diagnostic laparoscopic surgery in her stomach and intestines. The infections were particularly concerning to the medical team because most of them were found in the baby's blood and were caused by either fecal-borne, waterborne, or even skin-borne bacteria, all of which were very unusual to find in a blood culture. They ruled out hospital-acquired infections, whether from patient-to-patient transfer or due to some deviation from the hospital's usual hygiene protocols. No matter what they tried, medical professionals couldn't determine the source of Daria's infections, and finding no medical explanation for the number and type of infections Daria suffered, they began to suspect that someone was introducing bacteria into the baby's central IV line, which offered a direct route to the bloodstream. It had not escaped the medical staff's attention that Daria's mother, Blanca, rarely left the hospital room, giving her ample access to the baby's IV line. They had also noticed that Blanca often behaved strangely and asked bizarre questions, and she was repeatedly asked to stop putting blankets over the side of the baby's crib and closing the blinds, both of which interfered with their ability to observe the baby. 
They described Blanca as detached and emotionless and agreed that she did not participate in the baby's care, which they found unusual. Based on their suspicions, hospital staff installed a video camera in Daria's hospital room and monitored it over the course of five days. Three days after the camera was installed, Blanca tried to cover its lens with an alcohol wipe. Later the same day, the video showed Blanca walking out of the bathroom with one hand hidden by a sweatshirt. She approached her daughter's crib, grabbed the IV tubing, and triggered the IV alarm, which is designed to go off under various circumstances, such as when a kink develops in the line, when air is introduced into the tubing, or when medication is pushed into the line too quickly. After hospital staff reviewed the footage, a patient care conference was held, during which they confronted Blanca with their suspicions that she was intentionally infecting her daughter through the baby's IV. Court documents describe Blanca's demeanor at the time as flat, with no emotional response or reaction to the accusations. She admitted to covering the camera lens, claiming she was concerned for her infant daughter's privacy, and when she was told that Pima County Child Protective Services would be contacted, she remarked, I'm surprised that you haven't called CPS before now. For her protection, Daria, who was born in August of 2010, was taken into CPS custody on March 25, 2011, although she remained in the hospital, fighting for her life. Blanca was no longer permitted to have contact with Daria, who did not develop any new infections from that point forward, and her existing infections went away, allowing her to be discharged after a few weeks. Blanca was indicted on April 15, 2011, on charges of attempted first-degree murder of a minor and child abuse with death or serious injury likely. After her arrest, her family members spoke with the media. Her father, Rene, told ABC News that his daughter would never hurt her child and that he believed she was innocent. Blanca's sister, Yamara, however, said she wanted her sister to get help. I just want my sister to have help, not go to jail. We had struggled with this before. On May 31, 2013, Blanca was found guilty of her charge of child abuse. At her sentencing hearing in July of the same year, the judge asked Prosecutor Ryan Schmidt if he thought the maximum sentence of 17 years would be appropriate, and Schmidt replied, I do, based on the conduct, Judge. This is not a one time. I lost my temper and I hurt my child and I'm very sorry about it. This is not only repeated conduct, but it's repeated conduct with absolutely no remorse. The number of infections that the victim suffered, the number of times she came close to death, the tests that were performed on her, the number of doctors that were involved in her treatment, they all had an obviously significant impact on the victim. Blanca's attorney, Paul Skitsky, told the judge that his client could not show remorse while maintaining her innocence. He explained that Blanca grew up in a dysfunctional family situation and had limited intellectual abilities. Ultimately, Judge Scott Rash sentenced Blanca to 13 years in prison. Her conviction was upheld on appeal. Dr. Mark Feldman, the expert I've quoted throughout this series of episodes, was quoted in news articles about Blanca's case as well, saying that Munchausen by proxy is not a mental illness. It is a form of abuse, just like sexual abuse, physical abuse, and emotional abuse. It's just a variant. Blanca is currently incarcerated in the Santa Cruz unit of the Arizona State Prison Complex, Perryville, in Goodyear, Arizona. Her release date is listed as May 26, 2026. She's had a number of disciplinary infractions since 2015, and it also appears she has an immigration detainer, although it's unknown if she'll be deported to Mexico when she's released. It's not clear where her children are, but at the very least, they're free of her abusive clutches. What a relief to tell a survivor story for a change. There are so many more of these stories that I just couldn't fit into one episode. So many children who've suffered from the effects of MSP. So many women, and even some men, whose need for attention, sympathy, and admiration have caused them to force severe illnesses onto their own children, leaving them with lifelong effects if they left them alive at all. There's Sarah Dillard of Bend, Oregon, a former pediatric medical assistant who poisoned her 11-month-old son with morphine in 2005 and her 2-month-old daughter in 2009 in both cases to garner the attention of each child's father. She pleaded guilty in both cases, receiving five years probation for her son's poisoning and seven and a half years in prison for her daughters. Both children survived. There's Rachel Kinsella, a Missouri mother convicted in 2017 of assault and child endangerment and sentenced to 25 years in prison for poisoning her nine-year-old son, Patrick, with prescription medications for about a year, causing him to suffer seizures, hallucinations, and problems walking and breathing. Patrick, who's now 15, went through a number of unnecessary procedures, surgeries, and treatments while doctors scrambled to figure out what was wrong with him. Prosecutors said Rachel wanted attention for herself as well as access to an inheritance Patrick received when his father died in 2012. 
There's Danita Tutt of Cleburne, Texas, who was convicted of injury to a child and attempted murder in 2018 and sentenced to five years in prison and 10 years probation for starving her 13-year-old son, Colby, lying to doctors about his medical history and subjecting him to unnecessary tests and surgeries. She also exploited Colby, using his falsified symptoms to rake in money through a charity fundraiser. Fortunately, Colby survived. There's Kayleen Bowen Wright, another Texas mother who put her son, Christopher, through eight years of hell, including 323 hospital visits and 13 major surgeries. Kayleen claimed her son couldn't eat, had muscular dystrophy and cancer, and suffered from seizures and extreme fatigue. None of what she claimed was true, and in 2019, she was sentenced to six years in prison after pleading guilty to recklessly causing injury to a child. Christopher, a healthy, active 12-year-old who loves playing soccer and swimming, is now in his dad's custody, and he shows no signs of the illnesses his mother forced on him. There's Candida Flutie of Kermit, West Virginia, whose 9-year-old son, Elijah, suffered from a congenital condition called Hirschsprung's disease, which affects muscle movements in the large intestine. In 2015, the 35-year-old mother of four pleaded guilty to child endangerment and was sentenced to six years in prison for an incident at Cincinnati Children's Hospital earlier that year, where she withdrew fecal matter from her son's colostomy bag with a syringe and injected it into his IV line. If Elijah hadn't been in the hospital, he may well have died. The only explanation Candy gave authorities for why she did something so dangerous and disgusting was because she was hoping doctors would take a different medical approach. Elijah is a healthy teenager now, and his mother is out of prison and apparently has contact with him and his siblings. There's Kelly Turner, who awaits trial in Colorado on a charge of first-degree murder for the 2017 death of her daughter, Olivia Gant, who Kelly claimed was terminally ill with neurogastrointestinal encephalomyopathy. Kelly allegedly used her daughter's supposed illness to defraud independent donors, organizations, and Medicaid, and she gained both herself and Olivia a ton of attention, including news coverage, by checking items off the little girl's bucket list, including ride-alongs with Denver police and firefighters. Before Colorado, Kelly and her daughters, Olivia and Samantha, who Kelly also claimed was sick, lived in Texas. After Olivia's body was exhumed in 2018, no evidence of any of the diseases Kelly had claimed were found, and Olivia's cause of death, though still unclear, was not the intestinal failure her mother claimed. I'll probably do a deep dive on Olivia's case at some point in the future. There are so many more cases, too. All of these people willing to sicken their children for their own selfish gain. Why? How? I started this series with the intention of finding the answers to these questions, but I think I have more questions now than when I went in. On next week's episode, I have two very special guests who will attempt to answer some of those questions and who are uniquely qualified to do so. One is author Andrea Dunlop, whose latest novel, We Came Here to Forget, centers around a woman whose family has been torn apart by MSP. Andrea drew from personal experience with a family member to write this book, which I highly recommend, and I can't wait to hear her perspective. My other guest will be Dr. Mark Feldman himself, who I've quoted multiple times throughout the series. Dr. Feldman is clinical professor of psychiatry and adjunct professor of psychology at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, the author of more than 100 peer-reviewed articles in the professional literature on factitious disorders, an international expert in the field, and the author of five books on the subjects of factitious disorder, Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen by proxy, and malingering including his latest book, Dying to be Ill. His work has been featured in over 200 magazines and newspapers, and he has appeared on countless TV and radio programs talking about these complicated subjects. That's it for this week. Join me next week for what's sure to be a fascinating conversation. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod view photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dreamnote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net.
Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildrenpod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.